The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Karen McGovern. I am the Deputy Division Director of Legal Affairs for the Division of Professions and Occupations. I wanted <coughs> to welcome you and thank you for attending the joint stakeholder meeting for the Office of Athletic Trainer Licensure, the Office of Massage Therapy Licensure, the Office of Direct Entry Midwifery Registration, and the Office of Surgical Assess Assistant and Surgical Technology Registration. Um, before we get started, I wanted to um, take the opportunity to introduce Laura Bravo, um, the division's policy analyst, who will be helping me facilitate this meeting. Um, also online, we have Ophelia Duran, who is um, a program director in the division. Um, I wanted to start out first by um, explaining that in compliance with the governor's orders regarding um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we have tra transitioned to a platform that's 100% virtual. We certainly appreciate your flexibility. Um, I'd like to reiterate the importance of your comments today. Um, as a division, we make decisions every day that affect your life and your business. Your input is vital in the rulemaking process. Throughout this process, our goal is to create regulations that clarify and explain legislation, that ensure minimum competency to enter and continue practice, and to provide the regulations that are absolutely necessary for consumer protection without creating unnecessary barriers to the marketplace. Um, your input today will be part of the information that goes to the director as she consider, considers adopting um, this new rule um, in compliance with Colorado House Bill, I'm sorry, Colorado Senate Bill 2102, which requires providers to disclose discipline or convictions of sexual offenses. Um, the process for the meeting, um, I wanted to just touch on a couple of things. The meeting is being recorded and we will post it on the website um, in the next couple of days. Um, since we are holding the stakeholder meeting by webinar, um, if you wish to make a comment or have questions, please raise your hand by using the hand icon if you would like to speak, and we will unmute your line so that you can be heard by everyone. Alternatively, you can type your comment or your question in the question section, and then we will read it aloud. Before we start taking comments, I want to ask that anyone who's providing comments make sure to state their name and who you represent. Um, make sure that your comments are relevant to the rule that we are discussing today, which is up on the screen, um, and uh, or the proposed legislation, which is again Senate Bill 20-102. Uh, make sure comments limited to around five minutes, which is what I'm gauging based on the number of attendees. And then it's not necessary to repeat what someone else has said. I think that, that you know, saying that you agree with them or that you hold the same opinion um, works just fine and that will be noted. Um, as you just heard from my phone, um, let's make sure that if you're not calling in through your phone, that you have that muted. Um, or vibrate so that it doesn't interrupt the conversation. Um, make sure that when you're speaking, you try to keep the background noise to a minimum. Um, we will keep you muted unless you're speaking and then we will unmute you. Um, that makes sure that we don't get the crazy feedback that can often happen on these webinars. And with that, um, I wanted to get started. I think first we can kind of do a quick overview of Senate Bill 2102, uh, and then we can start uh, the conversation. So Senate Bill 2102 um, requires disclosure to patients of convictions of discipline based on sexual misconduct or convictions or guilty pleas to sexual, uh, sexual assault. Um, I think it's important to note here that patient is used interchangeably with client. For those of you that consider um, or call um, the person that you treat a client, 
I think it's also important to note that this is a, um, a very um, broad bill that covers a number of programs, which is why we're having this joint stakeholder meeting. Um, the requirements is that any healthcare provider, um, which is which um, any healthcare provider who has to report to the health professional program uh, profile program pursuant to the Michael Skolnick Act um, is required to make these disclosures. Um, as a division, that covers almost every one of our healthcare professions. Um, we have a variety. Um, there's not going to be one one stop, one rule for everyone because people are going to have different circumstances. And so we'll take a look at your specific circumstances. But recognizing that this spans from athletic trainers to room doctors to um, pharmacists who may or may not ever even have contact with a patient. So it's it's very broad and it's in it's, it's broad in its scope, but it's also very broad in its impact. Um, the important things to know about the bill um, is that there are exceptions specifically for um, emergencies. The other thing to know about this bill is that um, the requirement that the disclosure be made is um, your disclosure is only required to be made during a term of probation. So if someone is convicted of a sexual offense and they are serving probation, they need to make the disclosure during that period. But once they've successfully completed that probation, the disclosure is no longer required. Similarly, with professional licensure discipline, they're required to report that during the time that they are um, under a term of probation or under a term where their license may be restricted or have conditions, out, once they complete that, then the disclosure is no longer required. Um, one of the things that the bill requires is that a sample or a model disclosure form is provided through the rules. And so we will look at that um, after we take a look at the rules. Um, at this point, I want to open it up for anybody who has comments or questions um, about the bill, and then um, we can start talking about the rule. Thanks, Karen. And again, if you would like to make a comment or you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll unmute your line so you can speak to your group. Otherwise, you're welcome to send a written comment or question via the question pane, and we'll read that out loud. So either feature will work. Okay, it doesn't look like we have anything right now. Um, so let's just start looking at the rule. Um, this rule, uh, the, this rule, while um, it went into effect, let me look here at the date of signature, it went into effect um, July 29th, 2020. Um, actually, I'm, I'm incorrect. Um, it went into effect, uh, or will go into effect on September 1st. Um, but the required the disclosures are not required to be made until on or after March 1st, 2021. So that's the first point to start is that these disclosures will be required on or after March 1st, 2021. At that time, a licensee, a certificant, or a registrant, whatever class you fall into, shall provide a written disclosure to a patient and the patient is defined in the statute. And um, let me read that definition to you. It means a person who is seeking or receiving health care services from a provider. The term includes the parent, legal guardian, or custodian of a patient who is a minor under 18 years of age or a patient who lacks the legal capacity to consent. Um, so they shall provide a written disclosure to a patient, as we just defined, 
notifying the patient of instances of sexual misconduct, including a conviction or a guilty plea as set forth in the statute, um, or a final agency action resulting in probation or a limitation of the licensee certificate or registrant's ability to practice. The form of disclosure, um, it has to be in writing. It has to include all the information specified in the statute and is consistent with the sample model disclosure form set forth in the appendix to these rules. So um, the patient must, through his or her signature on the disclosure form, acknowledge the receipt, the receipt of the disclosure and agree to treatment with the registrant. Um, that will also be with the licensee. Certificate or registrant. Okay, so let's go down here and look at the model disclosure statement. And you can see that the disclosure statement goes through and provides an outline of everything that has to be provided under the statute. So um, the licensee has to include, at a minimum, their name, business address, and business telephone number. Um, they need to provide a listing of any final convictions or acceptance of guilty pleas for a sex offense that is defined in the criminal code. And for each, the provider must provide, at a minimum, the date that the final judgment was entered, the nature of the offense or conduct that led to the final conviction, and the type, scope, and duration of the sentence or other penalty imposed. This must include whether the provider pled guilty or was convicted, whether the provider was placed on probation, and if so, what is the duration in terms of the probation, and the jurisdiction that imposed the final conviction or issued the order approving the guilty plea. Third, um, the provider needs to um, disclose any um, final agency action by a regulator that results in a probationary status or other limitation on their ability to practice if the action is based in whole or in part on a conviction for a sexual assault, as we just talked about, or a finding that the provider engaged in unprofessional conduct or other conduct for, that, are ground, that constitute grounds for discipline under Title 12 of the Colorado Revised Statutes that regulates the provider's profession. If that conduct is related to sexual misconduct um, that either results in harm to a patient or prevents, presents a significant risk of public harm to patients. So that's a mouthful. Essentially, <coughs> a licensee or a certificate or a registrant has to disclose if the board or program that regulates their profession made a finding of unprofessional conduct either based on the conviction or based on other grounds for discipline where the, where the basis for that finding was sexual misconduct that either results in harm or prevents or presents a significant risk of public harm. And then we go through and talk about for each one of these disclosures, what needs to be added, the regulator, the date that the, they entered into the stipulation, um, whether or not it was an adjudication or whether it was an agreement, whether or not the provider was placed on probation, and if so, the duration and terms, were there any limitations based on the provider's practice, and if so, a description of that, the nature of the offense or conduct, um, including the grounds for unprofessional conduct, 
so the probation or, or practice limitations, what were those based on? The date the final agency action was issued, the date the probation status um, or practice limitation ends, and the contact information for the regulator who imposed the final action. We have a, a sample signature block. Basically, the patient would have to print their name and say they have received and read the disclosure and that they agree to treatment by the provider. Um, we have a space for their parent, legal guardian, or custodian, and then a space for the provider. If we look back up at the rule, we'll talk about the timing. This disclosure has to shall, which is mandatory language from the statute, be provided to, sorry, provided to a patient the same day the patient schedules a professional services appointment with the, the licensee certificate or registrant. If an appointment is scheduled the same day that services will be provided, or in instances where an appointment is not necessary, the disclosure must be provided in advance of the treatment. Um, the written disclosure and agreement must be completed prior to each treatment appointment with a patient or client, unless the treatment will occur in a series over multiple appointments or the patient schedules a follow-up treatment appointment. So if in those instances, one disclosure prior to the first appointment is sufficient unless the information changes since the most recent disclosure. And in that case, then a new disclosure form would be required. Um, and here is the important piece here um, under D is that the requirement to disclose the conviction, guilty plea, or agency action ends when the provider has satisfied the requirements of the probation or other limitation. Okay, so it looks like we have a couple of questions. Um, you do, you want me to start at the top, Karen? Yes, please. All right. So Suzanne Hamilton is asking, are the exceptions in the bill going to be contained within the rule? Um, uh, I think we can talk about that. Um, if you want the exceptions to be contained in the rule, I think we can, we can um, think about adding that. Is that something that you'd like to see? Okay. So Suzanne, if you have a preference one way or the other, or other comments or thoughts, feel free to send another question or comment or raise your hand um, and we can unmute your line. Then Sue Relahan is asking for massage therapists. If we do not have a conviction or discipline, do we still need to give all new clients a disclosure form saying the disclosure is required, but at this time does not apply? Uh, no, you are only required to make the disclosure if you meet the criteria in the disclosure. Okay, thank you. Catherine Cox is asking, once the probation requirements have been fulfilled, is disclosure no longer required? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Larry Hudson um, states, uh, I represent the Colorado Coalition Against Sexual Assault, CCASA, and was involved in the legislation. I wanted to point out that a provider who does not have a direct treatment or direct contact with the patient is exempt from this law, uh, and he provides a statutory citation, uh, which is 12-30-1415, apologies, uh, section 4A, um, which is on page five of the act. Um, and Larry, if you'd like to provide any other information or clarification, feel free to raise your hand. Thank you, Larry. Um, uh, Jane Doe is asking, hi there, will there be any communications on this call about the Occupational Credential Portability Program? Uh, no, this, this is... Uh... If you are this this joint stakeholder meeting is only to discuss Senate Bill 2002. Okay, thank you for clarifying. 
then Suzanne Hamilton said, I understood SB 102 to apply during a probationary period. License limitation only. Is that correct? And then she said, yes, please. I'm not sure. Um, Suzanne, I'm going to try to unmute your line. I'm not sure if you'd like to speak to clarify. Uh, Suzanne? Uh, yes, you thank, clarify your comment? thank you for unmuting me. The yes, please, was that we would like the exceptions, um, including the emergencies and those without direct patient contact, to be in the lead, to be in the rules if possible. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Um, great. Okay. I'll let Karen take a note on that really quick. And who was the uh, the stakeholder? That was Suzanne Hamilton. Okay. And what profession do you represent, Suzanne? Let me unmute your line, Suzanne. Suzanne, do you represent anybody or are you representing yourself? I do represent several clients that will be affected by this, the emergency room physicians, osteopathic physicians, and athletic trainers. Thank you. Okay. Um, Catherine Cox is asking, will the disclosure template be available for download? Um, yes, once the rule is filed, then it will be, a down, be available for download. We will also uh, uh, make it available on the website outside of the rules. Okay, great. Um, Jane Doe is asking, did you say that disclosure is only required if one is on probation? Yes, the requirement is that if the licensee, the registrant or the certificate is serving a time, a term of probation through the criminal courts for a conviction or a plea of guilty, they're required to make the disclosure. Once they have successfully completed the probation, the disclosure is no longer necessary. As it relates to the licensing action, the, um, the licensee certificate or registrant is required to disclose if they are serving a period of probation through the regulator, or if their license is otherwise limited or has condition on it based on that action. And again, once they have fulfilled those terms, then the disclosure is no longer necessary. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if part of the question might be, um, this I, my interpretation of her question possibly though, um, is what if somebody has a conviction which, in which they served um, prison time or are on parole? I think parole would, um, parole would be similar to probation. Um, and I think, you know, that's a good question and we can certainly look into that. Um, if the person um, serves a prison sentence, there's a period of parole that follows that. If they're practicing while they are on parole, then they haven't completed their sentence and they would need to make the disclosure at that time. Okay. We can clarify that in the poll. All right. Um, I think I have reached the end of the written comments for now. Um, does anyone else have a comment or question? Uh, feel free to send that via the question pane um, and also, or use the raise your hand feature. Yeah, please feel free to raise your hand um, using the hand raise um, feature if you want to speak, if you want to ask questions, um, engage in any dialogue. I mean, this is the opportunity to address these questions. And if you've already written something in, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand as well if you want to clarify or add some context or, you know, just provide some additional information. Um, that is perfectly fine at this point as well. So even if you've already submitted a written comment, um, we're happy to um, let you speak to share additional information too.
Okay, we'll give you guys a couple more minutes in case you're mid type. Are there any other specific areas, Karen, you were looking for feedback on or just general comments and feedback? So? No, I think general comments and feedback. I mean, I think that there, um, we can go over while we're sitting here, we can talk about the exceptions. Um, so I think that um, the, the exceptions include um, basically the, the, the statute says a provider need not make the disclosure um, by, um, required by this section before providing professional services to a patient if any of the following applies. The patient is unconscious or otherwise unable to comprehend the disclosure and sign the acknowledgement of receipt. Um, of, dis of the disclosure, and a guardian is unavailable. The visit occurs in an emergency room or freestanding emergency department, or the visit is unscheduled, including consultations in inpatient facilities, or the provider who will be treating the patient during the visit is not known to the patient until immediately prior to the start of the visit. A provider who does not have a direct treatment relationship or have direct contact with the patient is not required to make the disclosure required by this section. I think it's also important to note that um, the law specifically um, make, states that um, it is unprofessional conduct or grounds for discipline if um, the disclosure is not made. So I think that. Um, um, is perhaps a topic of conversation is making sure that um, these disclosures are part of the medical record um, to ensure that um, there's documentation that the disclosure was made and that the patient consented to treatment. Does anyone have thoughts about that? I did get one other question from Jane Doe. She says, this seems quite lenient toward offenders. Why is it not required always if convicted? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe you could clarify your question. If it's, it, I, I can interpret your question to mean, why aren't providers required to make the disclosure when they have, if they have a conviction, um, regardless of whether or not they are serving a term of probation or um, regardless of whether they've completed that. Um, I, and that I, I can't tell you, this is, um, this is uh, the bill that was, um, that went, it's what made its way through the legislature and was signed into law. Um, I know that, that uh, Mr. Hudson was on the phone earlier and he may have something to add to that conversation. Okay. Like so, yep, I see his hand raised. Uh, Jane also said yes. I'm not sure what in regards to. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Mr. Hudson first. Um, go ahead, and then we can come back to Jane to see if that whatever responses uh, help clarify the issue. Go ahead, Mr. Hudson. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure thing. Thank you. Uh, Larry Hudson here, um, representing the Colorado Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, um, we uh, felt, and um, Suzanne Hamilton on the phone, who I work closely with uh, as well, and she can um, either agree or clarify what I'm um, going to say around that. Um, we felt that it was important that um, due process uh, be um, um, highly considered once the um, healthcare provider or the licensee um, has either finished whatever their disciplinary um, or probationary term, whenever that has been, um, uh, when, whenever that finishes or has been completed, then the disclosure does not happen, does not have to be happen anymore. Um, and that it is important that it didn't have to go on for the lifetime of the provider's um uh term of practice if if they were still allowed to 
see patients or clients or, or however the various professions um, term uh, determine um, their their customers, so to speak. Um, we felt that it was important that the seriousness of the crime and that they or the or the discipline once it had been completed um, that their obligation to inform um, was complete too. Um, this is very similar and this this legislation a lot of it was modeled after um, the California Patient Right to Know Act that passed a few years ago um, but we tried to narrow this uh, as much as possible and cover all of the um, professions that had to that have to report to the Michael Skolnick database or the uh, health information um, database um, and, and and as well felt that um, limiting the disclosure uh, from a due process standpoint was um, important too. Thank you. And then Thank you for clarifying put you on the spot. I just thought maybe you could address that better than I was. Thank you. Um, so Jane, I'm not sure if that um, addresses your question at all. If you have further follow up, feel free to raise your hand. Um, sometimes I'm speaking over the phone or over your computer might be a little bit easier than back and forth on the chat. Um, so feel free to raise your hand and we can meet your line. Um, Otherwise, um, Ophelia, did you have something you might want to add? Ophelia, who's one of the program directors for the division? Nope. Okay, her line is not working. Um, she had sent a message, um, Karen, a question that maybe we should be considering is regarding telehealth and um, the role of this disclosure in the telehealth. Um, world. And so that's a good question of, you know, is telehealth um, services is, you know, relevant for those folks or um, would it not be? And maybe do we need to clarify that and rule one way or the other? I'm not sure if any stakeholders have any input on that. Any other input or questions? Feel free again to raise your hand or send a question or a comment. Um, we can give just a couple more minutes to make sure we don't have anyone that's mid-type. And then if we don't have any other questions, then um, I can talk about next steps. Okay. You see anybody, Laura? I don't, I don't see any new questions or comments written, and I don't see anyone's hands raised at this time. So, um, next steps will be that we will uh, take this template rule, we will um, look at the stakeholder comments, um, and Put this into um, a rule for each of your programs. Once we have that proposed rule done, uh, we will file the notice for um, rulemaking. We will send a copy of the final rule out to all of the stakeholders. So all of the people from our stakeholder list, including all of the licensees of these programs, um, to take written feedback on the proposed rule. Um, the rulemaking hearings are scheduled um, at the beginning of October. So for athletic trainers, the rulemaking hearing is scheduled for October 1st at 3.30. For direct entry midwifery, the rulemaking is scheduled for October 2nd at 2.30.
for su surgical assistant, surgical technologist. The rulemaking hearing is scheduled for October 2nd at four o'clock. And for massage therapy, the rulemaking is scheduled on October 2nd at one o'clock. Um, I wanted to thank um, all of you for attending. Um, I really appreciate your participation, your feedback, um, all of your, um, your engagement in this. It's, it's really helpful to us to make sure that we come up with a rule that's helpful um, to the licensees to make sure that we're giving them the roadmap they need to comply. Um, Karen, we had some more comments that were coming in. Okay. Um, so Jane Doe states, I think this protects people less and being informed of sexual offenders is necessary for the professional life of the offender. I want to know if my practitioners have it. That seems much better. And okay. then we had a question on process. Um, I don't know if you have any comments or follow-up for Jane first. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I understand and um, certainly appreciate your feedback on that. Um, but did want to point out that, you know, what we're doing now is implementing the law and the law has already been passed. Um, and so what we need to do is implement um, the law that was enacted. Okay, great. And then Sue Relihan asked, how do we attend the rule meetings? Um, we will send out the notice for the rulemaking hearing that will have the link for the webinar. And at this point, it is envisioned that these will probably be um, webinar only just due to the, the pandemic of COVID-19, correct? That's correct. They will be scheduled by webinar only. Um, we know that okay. will not be, um, it's anticipated that we won't be holding any in-person meetings before January. And that's really as far out as we've um, thought. So they will be webinars. We will send out the notice of rulemaking hearing that will happen on or about September 1st. Um, we will get that, that notification out as soon as we get the uh, rules filed with the Secretary of State. Secretary of State. Okay. We had a few more comments come in. Uh, Jane Doe asked, why was this law created? It sounds like jargon. Okay. Um, I, I can't. And then. Um, I I, I can't speak to that. I do think that Larry Hudson, um, who spoke earlier, um, discussed the purpose of the bill and 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 why it was put in place. Um, and so I think we can move on to the next um, stakeholder comment. Sure. And Larry Hudson um, had a question about receiving notices. Um, he wanted to note he's registered to receive stakeholder pro uh, emails for the stakeholder process seem to not be included on this SB 102 meeting. Is there a way I can receive notices for all of these as it relates to SB 102? Um, so I guess more generally speaking, how might folks sign up to receive notices um, on this bill and the rulemaking hearings going forward? Um, I think that the best thing to do um, is to, um, if you want to, if, if you want to sign up for rulemaking for all of the SB 102 moving forward. I think the easiest way to do that is to send an email to um, Dora, D-O-R-A underscore D-P-O underscore rulemaking at state.co.us and ask to be added um, to all of the notifications for SB 20-102 rulemaking. Um, for anyone else who's interested, if, um, if you represent a certain profession or if you are a member of a certain profession, if you go on to that profession's website, you will see a link that says, um, uh, let me, I'm gonna look directly so I can tell you exactly what it says. Um, it says, I think under division info and FAQ, it says receive rulemaking updates. 
There it is. Yep. So if you go on your um, website for your respective profession, um, which you will find, at, um, you can go to dpo.colorado.gov. And then you can click on your specific profession when you get to the website. If you click the blue bar that says division info and FAQ, there's a link that says receive rulemaking updates. Once you sign up, you'll receive all rulemaking updates for that profession. Again, if you want to sign up for more than one profession, it's best to just send an email to the rulemaking inbox and we'll get you signed up. Great. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I don't see anything else at the moment in chat and I don't see any other hands raised. Okay. All right. So um, I want to um, again thank you for participating. Um, the comments and recommendations will be presented to the director um, prior to the formal rulemaking hearing. And because this is early engagement, we'll actually provide her with this information before we finalize proposed rules to file with the Secretary of State. Um, and then making sure that you understand that at the time we file the rules, we will send the rules out to everyone on the stakeholder list, including all licensees, registrants, certificates of these programs, give you the opportunity to provide any additional feedback in writing. And then the rulemaking hearings um, provide an opportunity um, for testimony at that time. So um, this concludes the stakeholder meeting. Um, again, thank you for your participation and have a good day.